So let's go ahead um, with our first session um, of this tutorial, um, which is an introduction to the Kamigira system model and will be presented by Gokan Dana Bashoglu. Gokan is the current CSM chief scientist, a senior scientist in the oceanography section.
Hey, Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, are you seeing my screen share right now? With the slide, with the agenda, yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, because it says it's paused on my end because I have it in the um, like separate window, but it's working on YouTube, and I'll just make sure it's working in here. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Thanks for doing that. That's um, so useful. Yeah, that so we I should make that like a standard, a standard thing. Yeah, because I made it this morning. Because I mean, I started the YouTube stream and it just had my name up there. And I was like, this looks, this looks lame if people join. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I made this. I just used yesterday's and kind of took out that yesterday's information and just made this, made it bigger. Yeah, no, I like it. When you get a chance, can you send me the template for it? And um, cause I, I know that we have to like start thinking about our evaluate, you know, like next goals. And so want to be able to offer these kind of standardized things for mm -hmm. other meetings that we're doing online across the lab. Okay, yeah, I can, um, what I can do is I'll send you this tutorial one and then I can just make a like boilerplate template for other events. Yeah, that'll be good. And then I can put this one in the in the folder for the tutorial for next year. Cool, cool, yeah. Look out perfect. So yeah, yeah, I'll do this again. I'll start it off in the mornings. And then, um, so whenever people join, they can see it. And then on the YouTube stuff, so I can get that started. I had to actually do it differently to stream on YouTube because it was still picking up yesterday's information, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, I got that. that. Because it's the same meeting? Yeah, like you remember how we had that problem with the workshop for the atmosphere group? Yeah. Well, similar to that, like I did the live on custom stream, but seeing how it's the same meeting, it still saved the details I put in yesterday. Mm -hmm. I had to actually use the live on YouTube option and then go in there and edit everything after it was up. Oh. I'm so glad is, you're able to do that because that sounds yeah, complicated. Yeah, so this is the option that I have to be logged in. Whoever does it has to be logged into the YouTube account. So okay. I'll just pop on in the mornings and get it all started and then switch you over to actual host host. Yeah, so I can run, yeah. run breakouts. Yeah, I uh, just thinking about that but um oh i see that now that i'm the host thank you yeah, i just i just switched you over to host and then if you want to make me and gunter co-host because i think i've all spoken yeah yeah did i get the mesa today i am yeah i was here yesterday too or maybe i told you that um yeah. i saw tracy that was so great to see her in person <laughs> Is that the first time you saw her since March? Yep, in oh, person. Good morning. Hi. Hey, Gunther. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. So I just I just shared my screen with this um, kind of intro slide breaking out today's um, schedule in the diversity slide. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I'm gonna have some announcement to make this morning right before the Q&A panel session. And the uh, agenda is going to uh, slightly change. OK. And my first announcement will be that uh, we'll convene at 8.50 for announcement sessions. <laughs> yeah, I took, I took that out just because this is what's being shown on the YouTube stuff. And so I'll just. Yeah, no, no, it, it's fine. Like, people don't know it yet, so that it's. Uh, as uh, as we evolve in the, into this, you know, I realized yesterday it would have been great to add it to add this, right, like from the beginning. Oh, uh, this um, like the sharing the slide like this. Oh no, no, uh, that. But also to have some time in the morning to have an like to have an announcement time, just okay. in case we needed it. And this morning, for example, I need it. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> we received a bunch of constructive comments about how we could improve things uh, that it was great and so yeah, cool. we'll, we'll try you know 
Well, on the official agenda, it starts off at 8.50 with announcements. So but, that's because I, uplo I, I uploaded it yesterday evening. Oh, okay, okay. That, that's why. <laughs> okay. Sneaky. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's too much sneakiness. And because when, <laughs> when, when I uploaded new slides last, like on Friday, for instance, with new for the practicals, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, for, I forgot to tell students, ah, please update your slides. Yeah. Update your downloaded slides. <laughs> so Learn. So, Gunter, I'm going to send you a message that Chloe is still having problems. So, okay. I'll send you her email to see how you might um, help her. And then the other question, you know, we had that um, staff Google Google chat yesterday. Do you want to be in on that, even though you're not an official office hours person today? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, and, and today, um, uh, especially in the morning, I'll be on childcare duty, so you know I, I won't be attending everything. So okay. I might be sporadically on and off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when if, if I'm not there uh, for, at the beginning of the middle scientist session, if you could just uh, remind some like the basic rules sure. about sure. what this is about, that would be great. So I have the um, Slido admin panel popped up too, so I can moderate that. So the Slido, uh, it's not going to be used until the office hours later today. Oh, okay, okay. Because I think for the Q&A panel sessions, we have the, the poll everywhere questions. Mm -hmm. Like, so right now, there's, like as of this morning, there are 24 questions to go through for the first Q&A panel session. Okay. Are you, are you going to share the link before office hours so they can start adding questions or are you just going to wait until? Well, we're going, so for this morning, uh, I was thinking we, we would just wait. And okay. um, in my announcement, I'm going to say that we're going to send some links for them to ask questions beforehand. Okay. Um, and, 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 we, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I mean, unless you want me to share the link right away, it's what, what do you think is best? Um, so I think you could share it at that break at 1050 so they can ask questions over the break. And then as soon as office hours starts, there's questions to begin with, and then they can still get it during office hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, d d during the breaks, they can still meet among each other. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, Gokhan's lecture is uploading to YouTube right now. I got it edited. Oh, great. Thanks. So, yeah. So I added, I added awesome. the link to the full video to the webpage yesterday, and then the uh, video took a couple hours to process. But it's got, let's see, yeah, two minutes left of uploading to YouTube. So That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, in my in my announcement this morning, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be sharing two slides. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a couple of slides before leaving. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll stop sharing once everybody gets in here, or just let me know. Yeah, that sounds great. I think you can also force me to stop sharing. You can kick me off because you're co-host. <laughs> this great power comes. Great responsibility. I, I can kick off a co-host? Oh. I think you can kick me off of screen sharing because I, whenever I was doing it from the workshop, I kept forcing people to stop sharing their screen. I see. Now, when you two joined and I was screen sharing, did it automatically force it to full screen? Yes. Ah. So, yeah, that's the drawback of screen sharing.
I mean, that could be too that no, because nobody has their camera on right now. Mm. Well, I mean, every time I'm in a Zoom meeting and somebody screen shares it, does full screen no matter what, and I always have to just exit out or double click it. I've noticed after you exit out of full screen when people share that it doesn't do it when another person shares their screen. Okay. Um, for, for, for the slider uh, link, Ryan, do you think that you could, sh yeah, you, you, if you could share it at the break, that would be, that would be nice. And okay. uh, I don't think I'd be able, to, I don't, I, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'll be here. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll so, share it at um, the I mean, break, media scientists, right? Uh, after the media scientists, yeah. Okay. And yeah, we, we, we'll share it again at the beginning of the office hour session. Okay. So yeah, I'll share it in this uh, Zoom window and in this Slack so everybody sees it. Sounds good. Hey, Ryan, that behavior you're describing about going full screen when a participant shares, that's an option. It's, that's a setting within Zoom. That you can oh, change like a, that. Like a personal preference? So if you, if you go to the settings and go to the share screen section, one of them is a setting about, it says, enter full screen when a participant shares screen and you can disable that. Oh, perfect, thank you. <laughs> yeah, because it always, it always bugs me. Like if I have Zoom off screen and I'm doing other things, it takes over my whole computer. <laughs> I agree, That's I, <laughs> I'm glad that I found the option myself. Yeah, thank you, I'm glad you told me. Definitely turning that off. Hey Gustavo. Good morning. How's it going? Good things, how are you? Good. Um, uh, you weren't here when I said I have a few announcements to make this morning, so right before mm -hmm. you start. Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll take the floor for, for, for a couple of minutes, and then um, and if you, if you go over during the Q&A panel session, um, that's, fine. that's fine. OK, sounds uh, good. I, I was reminded that uh, like we're running out of questions to be, to be able to ask in the, in the poll, so a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> to answer by the panels. So. Did you stop? Um, did you close the, the, the option to uh, read the questions? I, I tried, but it said I can't. So maybe it means that I locked it already. It's really weird. Um, mm. Well, we can just remind them, just ask them to please do not start uh, rating or you know, thumbs up the questions as we we start addressing them, otherwise it's gonna happen the same that happened yesterday with Cecile. Yeah, but in, in, in theory. Is there I mean, a way to um, get rid of the question or hide the question once it's answered? So no, so it's like right, right now in this Polybrewer link, like you can still, apparently yesterday you could still a vote or downvote a question. Mm -hmm. And so as we're upvoting or downvoting questions, they kept moving while Cecil was trying to ask the panelists. So we're like, what, what, what happened? And so we're like, like, I just asked this question. Mm -hmm. And so it's like. Yeah, because in the Slido thing, it keeps it up there and then you can um, hide it from the view so people can't click on it. Oh. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it shows it's, it's locked right now, so. Let me try to. Yeah, it's locked. You can't do anything? No. Cool. Great. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good morning, Peter. Hi there. Good morning. Ah, been looking up all sorts of answers to questions this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you knew them all on the top of your head. Top of the head, I, <laughs> I had some uh, skin cancer taken off the top of my head a week or so ago. Oh, so some top question. of the head's not very good. Mm. So are you going to be in charge of uh, this, Gustavo, when it comes to the organizing the questions? Yeah, 
yeah the, what i'm going to do is i'll um i've rated i've selected them like um the, the most voted first and then we go down the list so we can just go one by one i'll share my screen we can go one by one and i have some slides for some of the questions too i don't know if anybody else has slides as well you can share them uh, i haven't prepared slides i just got stuff on the top of my head see <laughs> <laughs> The good thing about having an oceanographer be the moderator, you can always say, let the moderator answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> good thing question about... when, when we're stumped, we say that question is so easy, the moderator can ask and answer. Right. Yeah. The good thing about having the senior scientist, former CSM chief scientist uh, in the panel is that, well, I don't know, <laughs> but he might know. Okay, I'm gonna start showing my couple of slides before we start with the Q&A panel session. All right, go for it. So I guess you don't see this as a full screen right now. We do. Oh, you do? Yeah, you have a hundred tabs open. Yes, that's what I meant. Like my presentation is not in full screen. There's a lot of tabs, Gunter. <laughs> I'm a really busy man. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I pretend to be. Okay, uh, it is 9 a.m. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you're all doing uh, well and you had a fun day yesterday and uh, i realized i have a few announcements to make before we start with the first session of the q a panel session regarding the ocean and biogeochemistry and uh, there's a slight change in the agenda just to allow for this type of announcement to take place in the morning so we'll try to convene now at 8 50 in the morning every morning unless um stated otherwise like on friday we'll meet at 8 40. um Regarding the Q&A session, um, to try to prevent what happened yesterday when Cecilia and I was asking questions and have them go up and down all the time, we're going to try to freeze the questions half an hour prior to the beginning of the session. So try to go through the question beforehand and upvote or downvote them um, before the session starts. Um, about, so we received a a bunch of very constructive feedbacks and thank you guys so much for doing this. And so as, as I mentioned yesterday, we're learning and adapting as we go. It's our first timer. Um, for the lunch networking break that we tried to set up for you, for you to have time to meet among each other, um, we didn't plan any activities per se so, so that you could use this time um, for you. And we were kind of hoping that you would self-organize and one way to do this is try to maybe nominate a moderator for this session. Remember, this is your time. But uh, we do recognize that uh, you didn't have time to formally present your work or yourself. It's harder to do on Zoom. So we're going to try to do an activity on, um, at some point during the rest of the week along this line. So for tomorrow, we're going to try to have this. So try to prepare two, a two slide presentation, one about your work and one about yourself. And uh, think about this as an elevator speech. It shouldn't be highly detailed, very high level. Think about that your audience doesn't know anything about what you're working on. So avoid the details. And we're going to have to try, we're going to have, we're going to try to organize a speed dating presentation and see how it works. Um, and we will lay out the ground rules uh, tomorrow. Um, regarding office hours, and I'm very sorry about the confusion in um, in what happened yesterday. Uh, we I did update some of the slides last week, and I didn't realize that you know, I forgot that you guys might have downloaded the slides way 
before that. So please try to download the latest version of the practicals. And we should have the updated common lines and project code and queue specification. Um, also, if you can try to go through a practical session before the office hours start. Um, and you starting, we're, we're going to send out an email today um, that will give you links to ask questions for office hours beforehand, similarly to the, what we do for the Q&A session right now. Um, and this way, maybe if there are general questions uh, about the practicals that, like, that are not necessarily meant for you to move forward with the practical, then we could have someone answer them uh, in, in small breakout rooms during the office hour session. You will receive those links at some point today. Um, that's, uh, that's all the announcements I have to make. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to go ahead now start with the Q&A panel session of the day. And it's going to be moderated by Gustavo Marquez, who is a project scientist in the oceanography section and also the science liaison for the ocean model working group. His research is focused on understanding physical processes controlling the ocean circulation around Antarctica. And he's particularly interested in the role for, that these processes play in regulating the melting of ice shelves and the formation and export of bottom water. So with this, I'll yield the floor to Gustavo and enjoy this session. Thank you, Gunther. So I'm gonna start by first thanking the other panelists for participating. Uh, There's a picture of uh, all of us here. Some of these pictures are pretty outdated like myself. I still had hair at this time. Um, so as Gunter said, my name is Gustavo Marquez. I'm a project scientist. I'm, a, I'm the science liaison for the Ocean Model Working Group. Uh, we also have as a panelist, Peter Gent, which, uh, which is a, he's a senior scientist in the oceanography section, a former CS, CSM chief scientist. So uh, all the hard questions we can ask to him. We also have Kristen Krummerhert. Krumer, Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Kristen. Uh, she is a postdoctoral fellow in the ocean section working with uh, biogeochemistry. And we also have Keith Lindsay, uh, which is an expert in BGC. And you can also ask about any other components that Keith will know the answer. Uh, so thank you all for participating. Um, and I think we can go ahead and start jumping right on the questions. Let me share the other screen. Okay, can you all see the screen? Can you see Peter? Yep. So the first most voted question is for a known oceanographer, what are the top most five most important variables to keep track of in the ocean model to get a general overview of what's happening? Peter. Okay, so the five are velocity, temperature, salinity, density, and pressure. So, the ocean model solves for two equations for in the momentum equation for the horizontal velocity. And then it also solves two equations, one for temperature and one for salt. Then it calculates the density as a function of temperature, salinity, and pressure. And then it solves the pressure from the density in the hydrostatic approximation. So the, those are the five most important uh, variables. Velocity, temperature, salinity, density, and pressure. All right. Thank you. Next question is, can you explain in some more detail how double diffusion, due to the fact that Diffusion rates of temperature and salinity and salt are different 
works. Okay. I have a slide if you want, I can share that slide. Um, no, I was going to say that I Googled double diffusion in the ocean and a lecture came up by Tumor Radko at the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, in their summer school from about 19, no, 2007. And it has a very nice uh, introduction to uh, double diffusion. So there are two things that can happen with double diffusion. Salt fingers is the first, and that occurs when there's a stable density gradient in the ocean. So the density is getting lighter as you go up. Um, so the first uh, case is when you have warm, salty water over cold, fresh water. So the temperature gradient is stable with warm water on the top, but the salt gradient is unstable with more salty water, so denser water above um, lighter water. Now the double diffusion occurs because the diffusion rate for water is about a hundred times quicker, faster than the diffusion rate for salt. So in that situation, if you get a a little bit of water from the upper warm salty water that goes down, the warmth there can diffuse, aw diffuse away very quickly. So the, temp the temperature goes down, so the water goes from warm and salty to cold and salty, so it's denser. So then it can continue to go fall down uh, in the water column. This is producing excess salt down below and produces what's called salt fingers. And this can be reproduced in the laboratory uh, quite easily. And in that uh, document I told you about, there's a nice picture of salt fingers happening. Now, the second case is the diffusion case. And in this case, we have cold fresh water over warm salty. So in this case, the salt distribution is stable with fresher water over salty water, but the temperature gradient is uh, unstable with cold over warm. But the profile is still unstable, I mean, it's still stable. Um, so if some water this time goes down, remember it's cold, fresh, so it goes down. So by the quick diffusion of heat, it can warm up there. So then it becomes lighter. And so it goes back up. And in fact, it can go back up to a position above where it started from. Then it gets cold again by the diffusion process. And then it can go down. And in this uh, way, you can produce an oscillation or an instability. And it's called, um, diffusive uh, instability. So those are the two ways in which double diffusion can produce changes to the salt and temperature distribution in the ocean. And it is parameterized in the ocean model uh, uh, as a, a contribution to the vertical diffusion. So if you want to look in more details about how that parameterization is actually made, you can go to section, hold on, I looked it up. Uh, there's a equation 204, 214 in the POP reference manual. And the precise formulae for how that parameterization is done are uh, there. And it's in terms of a quantity called R sub rho, which is the ratio of alpha delta T over beta delta S. So it's the ratio of which of the temperature or salinity vertical gradients are dominating to keep the ocean uh, stable. Thank you. And just uh, want to add that in both POP and MOM, this is done exactly the same because we use uh, external library called CVMix to compute double diffusion. 
Next question is, when will the new ocean model MOM6 be available in CSM? So Gokan mentioned yesterday on his opening lecture that the next release CSM 2.2 will have CSM as the optional, as an optional ocean model, uh, although it's, it won't be scientifically, val scientifically validated, but uh, you will be able to experiment with MOM6 uh, in the next release, which is right now scheduled to be uh, some, sometime in September. Next question, can you explain a little more about the virtual salt flux in POP2? If the ocean conserves volume, how can it explain or simu simulate dramatic sea level changes in ice ages? Do you wanna do that one, Peter? Uh, you're giving me all the tough questions, but uh, here goes. Gustavo, I can pitch in a little bit here. Sure. Frank, you wanna go? Okay. Oh, so Frank Bryan is the head of the ocean section. So thanks for joining us as well. Well, the, the choice of virtual, I think there was another question further down, a similar question. Um, the choice of virtual salt flux actually is a bit of a legacy um, issue that earlier versions of um, the Brian Cox Sumner ocean models, which of which POP is a descendant, uh, used a rigid lid surface boundary condition so the sea level couldn't change. Um, so they necessitated a virtual salt flux um, uh, boundary condition in order to represent the influence of precipitation and evaporation on surface salinity. Um, POP as a free surface model actually does have the option of using what we would call a natural boundary condition, which is a flux of water in and out of the ocean as happens in nature rather than salt. But we do not use that in CESM um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that the, the POP um, uh, solution of the barotropic mode uses a linearization of the surface boundary condition on, on um, mass. And that, um, requires that the surface uh, grid cell, um, the thickness of the surface grid cell be large compared to the displacements of the free surface. And so that becomes problematic if you're adding and removing mass from the free surface, you can get into situations where the displacement from the forcing would exceed the numerically allowable um, displacement of the, the free surface. So we've stuck with the virtual self flux. In MOM6, we are moving to a natural boundary condition. So the surface is a material surface with respect to salt, um, and we exchange fresh water. Um, as to how you can represent um, sea level change in the ice age um, sort of scenarios, we can only do that indirectly, and we can't do it in a continuous integration by removing um, water from the ocean, we have to sort of reinitialize and do time slices where you change the land mask and the ocean depths as a function of um, time. So you would run forward with some fixed um, representation of the coastline, re, re, redo your topography, expose some more continental shelves, reinitialize the ocean and go forward. And I think that's the way the paleo group has done this in the past is sort of these time slice representations of the evolution of sea level through the tens of thousands of years over a glacial cycle. Um, if you want a detailed um, uh, uh, derivation of the differences between the um, natural boundary condition and salt flux boundary condition, there's an appendix in a paper, um, first author is Yu Hang Sang, T-S-E-N-G, in Ocean Modeling in 2016 about the representation of river runoff um, in the ocean model. And there's a, a careful derivation of the approximations used in the um, virtual salt flux boundary condition in that paper. So I'll leave it there. So I might add that uh, in the POP model, the sea level does have spatial variability in X, Y, 
but its global average is zero because it is a constant volume uh, model. So it can't represent uh, sea level rise uh, as a global phenomena. And the, this limitation is one of the major regions that, reasons that we were pushed towards using MOM uh, as a replacement for POP in the next version. And the MOM6 model can represent this changes in the globally average uh, surface volume. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has questions as we, we, we address the, the ones that were posted, please feel free to raise your hand and we can uh, address these additional questions. Going to the next one, is it worth to include any sort of substance scale parameterization in the MOM6? Yes, and in fact, it is already in there. The same submeso scale parameterization that we currently use in POP, which is the Fox Camper et al. parameterization, is also already coded into MOM6. Going to the next one, could, could you explain a little bit more in detail the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian or AL framework? And I will share my. Uh, I'm, I'm, no new slide to demonstrate that. And this slide, uh, we had a recent series of MOM6 webinars. And I'll, I took this slide from Stevie Griffiths, which was one of the people giving talks. And I you know if you want full details, I will point you to Steve webinar, which was very helpful. How do I share my screen again? Sorry, I'm having trouble with Zoom, too many screens. Okay. Can you see it? I can. Yes, great. So first, there are many flavors of the AO framework. And like broadly, AO refers to any method that considers the moving of the cell boundaries. And in particular, the way we, we do in MOM6 is just in the vertical. And uh, this diagram kind of summarizes what the AO framework does. So basically, you predetermined a vertical grid that you would like to use to represent your, your ocean in the vertical. So in this cartoon are the, the black lines are your vertical grid. And then you say, like say you start with this vertical grid and then you let the fluid evolve. And then you go to the second panel, the mid panel, where notice that the lines, the black lines are now just distorted. So they, they've moved up and down with the fluid. So this is a Lagrangian step. And so ev every ocean model that does that can be called, a has an AO framework. Now, what is different about the one in MOM6 is that it includes an additional regreeding remap step in which you tell the model that every certain amount of time, let's say a day, you go from these distorted vertical, uh, distorted lines, the black lines back to the predefined line, which you, you did it here. So you, what you do is then you use high order remapping schemes such that the tracer values and tracer velocity at, at certain points remain as, as close as possible to the to when you the, the fluid has evolved. So you're not changing the state. You're just reorganizing that state on a new on a new vertical grid. Does anybody want to add something to this? I think I can, uh, let me try and add a, a little. So in a, a grid that's X, Y, and Z fixed in volume like this, if you have convergence of water into that volume from the sides, 
then that water has to go out either at the top or the bottom of the grid. In a isopycnal or in an ale coordinate, instead of uh, the water going in, producing vertical velocities across the boundaries, it actually then just changes the vertical volume of that, uh, of that grid. So you don't have vertical advections on the, on the top and bottom boundaries of the grid. So the grid changes and you have to have, solve an equation for the evolution of the depth of the grid at each point. And then every so often, just as Gustavo said, to get things back into uh, not, so things don't uh, go haywire and drift away, you remap the distribution you have in the vertical back to uh, close to the original uh, Z coordinate uh, uh, grid. And the AL method has advantages in that you can control much better the amount of vertical diffusion that you have between the layers in the ocean model. In oceanography, there is very, very small vertical diffusion across boundaries between density surfaces uh, compared to the amount of diffusion along between isopycnals. Uh, so it's always very important in ocean models to try and control the amount of vertical diffusion across density surfaces because that's measured in the ocean to be extremely small. An advantage of the AL method is you can control that much, much more precisely and better. Thank you, Peter. And if you want full details on AL frameworks, again, just Google MOM6 webinars, and then is the lecture given on April 13th by Steve Griffiths. Oh, Pretty thanks, Elizabeth, Elizabeth already posted. Thank you. Okay, so now we have uh, the Cato predictability question, which maybe Peter will be able to help, or Frank. Can you talk more about the potential processes in the ocean that are known to be able to provide seasonal to the Cato or even longer time scale predictability? Frank, when you start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think in general, the predictability on these longer time scales exists because there are processes and dynamics in the ocean which evolve on slower time scales than synoptic weather time scales in the atmosphere. So on the longer end of those time scales, they are basically all associated with the um, generation and maintenance of heat content anomalies. Um, so a, you know, some anomalous weather um, or even a stochastic kind of weather process um, will rectify into lower frequency um, evolution of heat content anomalies in the ocean, which can then be transported, for example, by the uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation show up in the North Atlantic, which can then um, force um, anomalous conditions in the atmosphere. So that's sort of a Atlantic multi decadal mode kind of um, variability, which is, I think, the decadal mode that's been found to provide the most predictability on these decadal time scales. On the seasonal to interannual time scales, I think uh, this is not my area, but my, my um, understanding is that most of that predictability is basically coming out of the equatorial Pacific thermocline heat content anomalies and the variability associated with El Nino and the, the resultant um, changes in sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. And again, although um, there are different processes than in mid latitudes. There are dynamical modes in the tropical ocean which evolve on these sort of monthly time scales and adjusting the heat content back and forth across the equatorial Pacific um, that can then um, manifest in anomalous surface fluxes and 
uh, forcing of the atmosphere, which gives you this longer range of predictability. Okay, I might add that uh, the observations show that of the extra heat that increasing carbon dioxide has brought into the uh, Earth's climate system since the increases started, over 90% of that heat has actually gone into the ocean because the heat capacity of the ocean is so much higher than that of the atmosphere. So the uh, question is important for then uh, the ocean model is to get the distribution of that heat into the ocean correctly. So how much of it stays near the surface and how much goes down into deeper uh, overturning uh, circulations? The rate at which that happens is very slow. So there are long time scales for that heat distribution in the ocean to take place. And so that's why the long time scales are just sort of inherent in the ocean compared to the atmosphere. And I saw one question I think yesterday was, what's the spin up time for the ocean? So the the few times we've actually done an experiment where we've integrated an ocean model out to equilibrium from a change, the equilibrium is close to equilibrium after 3,000 years. So the equilibrium time for the deeper part of the ocean, which is dictated by that small diffu vertical diffusion coefficient, is a few thousand years, far, far, far longer than the atmosphere. Thank you, Peter and Frank. Why the Rossby radius is a measure of the eddy resolving scales? Um, I can try addressing and then uh, someone can, can chim in. So the way I think about this is if you have, you have a perturbation, so let's say you have a instability, a baroclinic instability, and then it, it generates an eddy. And then that eddy is being balanced between um, buoyancy and, and rotation. So the Rossby radius is essentially a, a ratio between buoyancy effects and rotational effects. And then the, the first Rossby radius of deformation, it is the, the scale that represents the mesoscale eddies in, in pretty well. Does anybody want to add to that? Well, I'd say, I mean, it, the, the, the dominant scale of eddies in the ocean is um, near the Rossby radius um, because that uh, is the scale at which the instability grows most rapidly. Um, the, you know, sort of the simple ED um, baroclinic instability problem, the classic ED problem, the maximum growth rate is something like 1.6 times the Rossby radius. So those are the per perturbations that are growing most rapidly. So those are the ones that you see most readily. Okay. So the strength is that that's the key is the baroclinic instability fastest growing is like uh, a few times the Rossby radius. And the Rossby radius is far larger in the atmosphere in the ocean because the in the atmosphere, the density goes from the surface value to almost zero high up. So comparatively, it has a much stronger vertical density gradient than the ocean. The difference between the density at the surface and the deep ocean is only a few parts per thousand. And as you get to higher latitudes with colder water, that density difference goes down even more. So the Rossby radius in the ocean varies from around 200 kilometers at the equator to more like 10 or 20 kilometers at high latitudes. And that's the reason that an ocean model with a one degree resolution can't actually resolve these mesoscale eddies. And that in a uh, model with a one degree resolution, the effects of mesoscale eddies have to be parameterized. Thank you. Ocean couples less frequently than the atmosphere. So for each coupling, the ocean will take the average of multiple inputs from the atmosphere since last ocean coupling. And the atmosphere component has to use the same input from ocean until the next time ocean coupling. 
Is that right? Keith, do you want to answer that? You're muted, Keith. Um, this is correct, yes. Um, so let me just read you, just read. the ocean is using uh, the inputs from the atmosphere from the last interval. And the way that we run, uh, the, the atmosphere runs and we, in the flux coupler computes air-sea fluxes and then the actually I, the ocean will use that in its next interval after that. So yes, there is there is a lag that occurs because of this. Um, there are other there are options within CESM to control the coupling sequencing, one of them is referred to as tight coupling, and I think it changes the answer to this question, but I'm not familiar with the details of how tight coupling works. But I do know that there are some options that modify how the lags occur between the ocean and atmosphere. Um, but yes, the, the, the states, the fluxes are computed, and then you get an average over the coupling interval that, which is passed to the ocean. And then the ocean computes its time average state, which is used subsequently for computing fluxes uh, in the next interval. I'm not sure if that was a clean answer. The short answer is that is correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. When we do a couple ocean atmosphere simulation, how many types of ocean model can we choose from? Like slab ocean, mixed layer ocean, and others. What's the main concept of these different types of ocean models? And how should we make decision about choosing which model type? Who wants to answer it? Frank, do you want to go with that or not? I'll start, and I, I may not have the most accurate information, but I don't know. Well, the basic reason you would want to use these different types of ocean representations is whether or not you, how you want to represent the storage and transport of heat by the ocean. Um, a slab ocean or a mixed layer ocean model do not represent the horizontal transport processes in the ocean. Um, so they can't represent ocean heat transport directly. You may, with, a, with those classes of models, you might prescribe a meridional heat transport that's been diagnosed from another experiment with a full ocean model or observations. But the, those models don't include the dynamics to represent those processes. I think a slab ocean model generally refers to a, a layer of constant depth. Um, although I'm, that's, that terminology is maybe not that well defined. Whereas a mixed layer ocean model might um, represent the seasonal changes in the ocean, upper ocean um, mixed layer, the homogeneous layer near the surface and thereby changing the upper ocean heat capacity um, uh, the fast, the part of it that's exchanging with the atmosphere on fast time scales, the seasonal change in that um, heat capacity. Now, I don't think, maybe Keith or someone else can correct me, that anything other than a full dynamic ocean model is available as a standard comp set in CESM. I don't know, Keith, do you know if we have a a standard comp set that includes one of these other alternatives? Um, there are certainly the, people doing these kind of experiments, but I'm not sure um, how that works. I think there are runs that use, it, 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 another option is to where, so there's an active ocean model that has 
full dynamics. And that's what us in the oceanography section mostly run. So, and then there's this, the alternative is a data ocean model. In one, and there are comp sets that use the data ocean model. One is using just a prescribed SST field. And so that would be used in AMIP runs. And I would, I think that there are going to be comp sets for that. Um, and I think that the, deep, the data ocean model can also work in a mixed layer configuration, um, a slab ocean. And I'm assuming, I'm trying to figure that out right now. <laughs> Um, just uh, I'm running a create new case command to see. So if I should I share my screen? Sure. Um, so that people can see what I'm doing. So th th there's useful commands for investigating what comp sets are available. And I think that, that in this question gets into that. So I'm gonna square, share my screen briefly. Um, so I am in a checked out version of CESM uh, 2.1.3 and I'm in the SIEM scripts directory and if I run the command query config, if I pass it, the, I can never remember the syntax for it as I always use the test H option to see um, what I want, to, what the options are. Uh, so I want to look at comp sets and I would look for a Comp sets, actually no, components, because I want to see what is using the data ocean model. The ocean. And this comes up with a number of um, options for data ocean model. This actually didn't show me the comp sets. So I guess what I really wanted to do was comp sets. Um, and maybe with cam. And don't have pop. So there are F comp sets with lots of variations that use a data ocean model. And I, I don't I don't run with data ocean model, so I don't know all of the can configuration options for it. Um, the atmosphere group might know more about these options, um, but there are certain, there are plenty of comp sets here using the data ocean model. Um, and I think this D DOM is probably that data ocean model. Um, so let's see if there's something in here with AMIP. Nothing with AMIP in the name, but the FCOM set is where you have an active atmosphere in a data ocean model, and there's different options for that. So that's elaborating a bit on what Frank was talking about. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Keith. And um, if someone has a, a question or if you're not sure what to use, feel free to reach out to any of us and we can, if we don't know the answer, we will direct you to someone else that knows the answer. Okay, BGC question. Are there plans for developing prognostic GMS emissions for ocean biology? And would it be possible to couple it with the atmospheric chemistry slash aerosol schemes, for example, in CAM or MAM4? I just wanted to bring up on this one. I saw um, there's a paper by Shanlin Wang that where she does something very similar to this. Um, running um, 
CSM with a uh, phytoplankton functional type representative of uh, phaocystis, which, re which uh, releases DMS into the atmosphere and then has a feedback on clouds. And so it has a cooling effect. And so, yeah, this is um, published. So somebody has done something like this. Um, I'm not sure what the specific science question would be here, but um, I can put the link to this article in the chat box. Um, Looks like uh, Nicola Wiseman has already done that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there were plans to include so that the oh. I'll, I'll follow up on what Christian described. Uh, there were the DMS capability for the ocean biology was primarily being done through uh, Los Alamos labs, and they've now transitioned to the MPAS ocean model. Um, you know, I'm not sure if they've transitioned that ported the DMS capability into the marble framework that we are now using. And so we've sort of had, uh, there had been plans to incorporate this, uh, but that has sort of, that's not one of our top priorities right now. Um, I imagine if someone was interested in pursuing this, then we could get the proper people together to facilitate um, getting the prognostic DMS, the sulfur capability into marble. Um, and then the coupling could be done as was done by the Lionel DOE group. I wouldn't call that, a, it's not a top priority for CESM presently. Thank you, Chris and Key. Next question, is CSM able to adopt different time steps over different regions? For example, if we do refinement in one region, which requires a small time step to maintain stability, can we use a large time step for all the regions with coarser resolution? Um, the answer is no, not in the ocean model. So both of ocean models that we have right now, POP and MOM are curvilinear, use a curvilinear horizontal grids. So there is some, small refinement as you, you move in different regions, uh, not much, not like an unstructured grid like NPAS Ocean. However, like you still limited by the smallest grid spacing, your time steps still limited by the smallest grid spacing in the globe. What is the spin up time for the ocean? Peter already addressed that question. So basically you can use the vertical diffusivity, which is what is dictating how the ocean interior is mixing and divide that by uh, the, or actually you, you divide this is the square of the, the depth divided by the vertical diffusivity in the interior, you'll give you an approximate time scale for the ocean interior equilibration remembering that you use a, uh, a dynamical vertical diffusivity rather than a molecular one. So it, in the end, it's slightly larger than the molecular diffusivity, but it's in the order of thousands of years. Are tides taking into account? If so, how? Yes, tides are taking into account in the vertical mixing of tracers and momentum. And, and the way we do that, so for example, you're trying to represent things like the internal wave breaking in the ocean interior, as well as when internal waves hit the continental shelf and, and you have enhanced mixing in these regions. So there's different schemes to prescribe how tides affect the vertical mixing. We use a particular one called, I think, Simons et al. Um, and yeah, I don't know, anybody else wants to add to, to that, how tides impact the vertical mixing? Uh, I would add that that scheme means there's much more tidal dissipation over rough bottom topography in the ocean. And the tidal dissipation is weak over flat topography over the abyssal plains. And that's guided by observations of dissipation in the deeper ocean, which have been shown to be far larger over rough topography than over smooth topography. 
Thank just you. clarify that we're not explicitly representing the tides. We don't have a tide generating force in POP. I think there is or there are plans to put a tide generating force in MOM6 so that it can explicitly represent the barotropic tide and to some extent the transformation of the barotropic tide into internal tides. Thank you, Peter and Frank. What are the advantages slash disadvantages of a regional MOM6 over all the regional ocean models such as ROMs, for example? Uh, so I can try, start addressing, and then and someone else can, can add. So in terms of advantages, uh, MOM6 is an ocean general circulation model that has been developed for climate purposes. So things that Peter were, was mentioning earlier that you, you want to have small numerical mixing in the ocean interior. So MOM6 has been designed with that in mind. So it, it is, you know, by default design for these long uh, integrations periods in which you, your, your numerics are good enough to do not affect your solution too bad. So that's an advantage for climate studies um, compared to, for example, realms. Another one is uh, you wanna have a consistency between your large scale model with your regional scale model. So having the same for both, it is an advantage in my opinion. Um, we do have the AO framework in MOM6, as we talked earlier, and that is another advantage. And finally, more from a development point of view, MOM6 is a much easier and faster pace the model to develop because MOM6 does not have something like an, a joint model like ROMs in which makes it much harder to develop the model. Every time you need to change something, you also need to change the adjoint for that, which is a complicated piece of code. In terms of disadvantages, uh, what I can think of is MOM6 is not as widely used for the coastal physical oceanography community as realms. And also the open boundary conditions, which is a very important piece within the regional framework it's still underdeveloped under development in MOM6 as we speak. Um, at the latest meeting that people are doing that kind of work, the, the results are pretty good between MOMs and MOM and ROMs, but it is not the open boundary conditions in MOM is not as well established as it is in ROMs, I would say right now. Any other points? I just add that I Certainly at the moment and probably for the foreseeable future, MOM6 will be a hydrostatic model. Whereas I believe there are non-hydrostatic versions of ROMs and MIT GCM, which are also used in the regional modeling community. And that is, as Gustavo was saying, a result of its history as starting as a global model um, and not really originally designed to work on these very small scales. Thank you, Frank. Next question, how exactly are the oxygen sources and sinks of the ocean accounted for? Is it just via interaction with the atmosphere or is there a lot of more to it? I can take that. Um, so there are, when the, there are sources and sinks of oxygen that are computed prognostically from the, the marble library that um, when there is uh, photosynthesis by plankton, uh, oxygen is produced and there's a ocean tracer of dissolved oxygen that increases from that oxygen production. And when or in that is creating organic matter and that organic matter it, uh, remineralizes or decomposes back into a inorganic form of the that oxygen is consumed in the process of doing that. And the oxygen tracer is uh, decreased when that remineralization happens up to a point where oxygen becomes low and you have um, anoxia in, in which when you get to a low oxygen environment and there's decomposition, the decomposition rates slow and the oxygen consumption rates slow as well. There's also a 
air sea flux of oxygen with the atmosphere based upon the saturation solubility of oxygen in seawater, which is a temperature and salinity dependent computation. So the cold water holds more oxygen. And if the water is undersaturated, then with respect to the equilibrium saturation concentration, then the ocean takes up oxygen from the atmosphere and vice versa if the ocean is super saturated with respect to that equilibrium saturation concentration. Um, the atmospheric boundary condition is fixed in oxygen. Um, the amount of oxygen that goes in and out across the air sea exchange is very small compared to atmospheric concentrations. And we treat the atmospheric concentration of oxygen as, as a fixed value. So we don't change the atmospheric concentration of oxygen when we have air sea exchange. Um, I'm just going to add that I'll put the the line for the um, from Marble Code from for the um, calculating the production and consumption of oxygen. I'll put that in the chat chat box. There. Um. Thank you. All right, so we are, it's nine fifty four a.m. now. I think we have until ten. Is that right? Will the the link go? Will the Zoom call? Uh, be shut off at 10. Can anybody tell that to answer, please? So the, the Zoom call doesn't get shut off, but uh, until it's uh, until 9.50. So um, you can take like two, like a couple more minutes before like a break and before we move to the next session. Okay, so let's go to 10. Thank you. Why is fresh water flux treated as salt flux? So Frank already addressed that question and he also posted a reference on, on the chat for, for a paper addressing that. Can you talk more about the Caspian Sea issue? Well, Gustavo, I think you've missed out the one about the, uh, oh, yes. the, the densities. Thank you. So yeah. the, the answer to that is that we use the most accurate one, which is C described in the, uh, in the manual. And the most accurate one has been speeded up quite a lot uh, recently, uh, well, recently, about 10 years ago. So no reason not to, 10 years ago is recent in my calculation. <laughs> um, so there's no reason really not to use that. The, uh, the other ones are uh, uh, more older approximations, which aren't as accurate. So there's no reason really not to use the most accurate uh, 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 calculation, which is described as C in the manual. Thank you, Peter. Now, Caspian Sea issue. Does anybody want to talk about that? Well, I'll just say that we've removed it from the ocean in the most recent versions of CESM because it's not connected to the rest of the global ocean. It's a, basically a lake. And for many, in fact, the, I think it's, may still be the case. The topography is completely wrong in CESM because the National Geophysical Data Center's topography database had the level of the surface of the Caspian Sea for its depth. The, the surface of the Caspian Sea is about 30 or 40 meters below mean sea level. So in the model, the Caspian Sea is a uniform 30 or 40 meters deep, when in fact it is about 800 meters deep. Um, so in the end, because it's really not connected to the ocean, it's not an ocean, um, we removed it and is now represented as a lake in the land model, as it should be. Thank you. Is there a way of fast spin up for the ocean model? Mm -hmm. Keith? Um, so for the tracers, the, the passive tracers, um, this is a work of this is active research. Um, and there was actually a webinar that I gave on this topic yesterday. Um, Elizabeth included a link to the webinars in the chat. Um, I don't think my talk has been posted there yet. Um, but there's software under development for spinning up passive tracers. 
um, there, it is not yet applied, been applied successfully to the active tracers temperature and solidity. So that, that's trying to find, th these are trying to find equilibrium solutions to ocean tracers. Uh, another interpretation of this question is if you're running the coupled model, or if you're running with particular surface forcing, if you run an ocean ice configuration of the model, that tends to be much faster than running with an active atmosphere. And so if you want to run the ocean model with, you can run the ocean model with forcing from a coupled model and run the ocean model much more, you can get more years per day in an ocean ice configuration using forcing from a coupled model than you can when you run with the fully coupled model. So I'm not certain how this question, if they were thinking about spinning up tracers to equilibrium or just getting more years per day in a particular configuration. So uh, there are work in progress on the former and we, you can do the latter of getting forcing from the coupled model and running ocean ice uh, configurations with that forcing. Thank you. What are the limitations of using inherent optical properties within the sea ice model? Are there any efforts going on to move towards more physically realistic calculations of sea ice optical properties? So, Gustavo, I have to leave because I'm on the meter scientist at 10 o'clock. So, okay. Um, the say, hard question comes and then you leave. The hard question comes and I leave. Peter, it's the it's the same um, Zoom link, so you can just hang out. Um, oh, you can also okay. step away if you need to, but, but we'll just roll right into the next session. Oh, okay, good. No escape. <laughs> but I don't know the answer to this yeah, <laughs> question. Yeah, I think that's a question for um, yeah, the, the polar Q&A. They will be able to address this better than, than us. All right, so I'm going to skip that one. Let's end the session with one more last question. Uh, let's get this last one here. What is the method that seam coupler uses to couple the ocean and the atmosphere? So Keith already addressed this somehow. There's different ways, there's different options to couple them. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if we know what the advantages and disadvantages are of each one. Do you know, Keith? No, I don't. Yeah, so this is also a question maybe for um, someone in CSAG, perhaps. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, it's 10 o'clock. We're going to now switch to the media scientist. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the panelists. for so, Gustavo, or this might be for Gunter also, um, two more questions down was a question about switching ocean biogeochemistry off. I prepared a PowerPoint slide on that. Should I send that to Gunter so that that can be distributed to the people that asked this question? Or who should I send that slide to? Gustavo. To me? Yeah, okay, and then I can forward it to the students. Okay, perfect. And the absorption of solar radiation is described in section 10.1 of the uh, POP manual. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, all right, well, then we cover almost everything. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, and um, yeah. bye-bye. So th thanks everyone for this session. Um, let, let's take a quick two minute break. And in the meantime, um, Elizabeth is going to assign you in breakout rooms with scientists that you were paired with. And if you have not been paired with scientists this morning, then you can just log off and wait until the lunch break to uh, come back up. And otherwise, if you don't want to uh, be part of the lunch break, then you can just come back up for the, for the office hours. Thanks.
Good job, Gustavo. Went quite well. Thanks, Peter. And thanks for helping with all the hard questions, as always. Oh, I think it's a good method for the students to post the questions because we get we got way more questions than we normally do after lectures. We normally get like five, and we had like or know, five times more than that. So this is good. So Marilyn Raphael, hi. Dr. Gent, how are you? Uh, I'm fine after the result of the England West Indies cricket uh, series. <laughs> I bet you were worried after the first test. <laughs> I was a little worried after the first test, but the second <laughs> and third went the way they should. <laughs>